cannot follow that opening. Hi guys, my name's Leanna Kersner, previously of Ed and Red's Night Party. Woo! Thank you, that guy's over there. Uh, now of Agents of Cosplay on the Escapist website. I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, we won't be using the chairs much uh, because our, our guest of honor would prefer to stand, so you're gonna watch us do dueling microphone courts for 45 minutes, but uh, you guys all know who you're here to see, but I have to do a fancy introduction to get the energy up, right? Yeah! yeah. You guys are gonna cheer lots, right? Yeah! And you're gonna have a lot of questions that don't involve asses and mouths, right? <laughs> so close. All right, you guys know who you're here to see today. He's best known as Dante from Clerks. Yeah! But he's also got a very varied and illustrious career. You're going to be able to hear him soon on the O'Halloran podcast, which is coming up on Kevin Smith's network. Yay! This is being recorded for that podcast, so be sure to ask questions. Um, I'm happy and honored to bring to the stage Mr. Brian O'Halloran. Big round of applause for Leanne, everyone. So there's Purell on the stage. There's I don't Purell. know if that's so he doesn't catch Canadian or he's been warned about me. <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be like one of those um, Lollapaloozas where I spray the audience with it. Awesome. We'll go total like Karen Tompkins like, oh, Gallagher. Why? <laughs> I just wanted to ask about Vulgar. Now there is apparently a microphone somewhere. In, in the stand, there it is right there. Uh, we're gonna start, but this is your time with Brian. You're here to see him, I it's can... Dirty. <laughs> time, Brian. <laughs> All right, that caution about the ask to mouth stuff, just, just go for it. Yeah, um, better, yeah. Please, There's... if you have a question, just line up now when we get a decent line of people. We're just gonna go right to the questions because this is your time. But Brian, so people know, what Cork's questions are you sick of answering? No, oh, they can ask away. You know, it's the first time here in Western Canada, so to speak, so they probably haven't heard some of the things yet. So by all means, ask away. Um, uh, definitely, I, I, if you're offended by a certain language or certain adult conversations, um, you're in the wrong fucking room. So. <laughs> yeah, fuck off now. <laughs> if you are highly offended on different things, I just want to give you that warning that things might get salacious. If you didn't know this, you didn't see any of my movies, I'm sorry. <laughs> there is a Michael Rooker photo op going on right now, by all means, make your way towards the photo op area. Now, do you get a lot of do the line, do the line? Um, I, it's not do the line, do the line as much as, are you supposed to be here today? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm always like... <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I can't remember the last time I heard that. No, um, you know what, and I get it, I don't get all Gary Coleman on people and be like, stop saying, you know, you know what his catchphrase was, what you talk about Willis, because he used to get all bent out of shape and chase people with a stick. And, and he was like this tall, God rest his soul, and, you know, and so I always thought to myself, why would you, why would you get bent out of shape out of something that, you know, I'm very proud of being a part of, that brought people joy, that for days and years and decades on end, people would quote incessantly, you know what I mean? You're talking about, I'm sure heads of state at one time has said, <laughs> sitting at their desks or at some sort of function going, oh, I'm really not supposed to be here today. You know, it's things like that. You don't get a lot of people go, try not to suck any dick on the way through the parking lot, you know? <laughs> well, there were the Clinton years. There were. The... <laughs> but that was just Republicans only saying that. Republicans so, don't watch Clerks? Oh, they do. They just don't admit to it. Right. Because you know I figured I mean? they'd watch it and figure out how to gut them in a Yeah, equation. Yeah, that whole Ashley Madison thing, I am sure that there are a lot of uh, Republicans on that list. <laughs> one, like, I don't know what to talk about. I thought Ashley Madison was a, a ticket for running. Uh, Mr. Ashley and Mr. Madison were running for office somewhere. I thought it was, but it was a pack, a super pack or something. I was putting in my information for that. <laughs> now, you've been reprising that role. And I mean, reprising the role isn't the same as doing it consistently. You've got to get sort of back into that space. Is it natural for you now, or do you need sort of like, oh, right, I've got to go back and watch it to remember what I did? Um, 
you know, what's great about Kevin as a writer is that he knows how to, to, to really pick the dialogue that fits that character, my kind of uh, encapsulation of what Dante was. I mean, let, let's put it simply, he was a whiny fucking bitch. <laughs> All right, given, it's granted he was called in on his day off when he meant to be playing hockey and his girlfriend cheated on him with 36 other guys. You know, it's a rough day for him nonetheless, but at the same time, Getting back to that space, what was a really good, helpful thing is we did it with the in '94 with the original Clerks. We got to visit it somewhat in um, Jay and Silent Bob Strikes Back. We then brought it out with the the cartoon series. So it was every time hitting it, there wasn't too much gap of time. When it came to Clerks Two, it, it, you know, it, I think it was about maybe five or seven years that we were able to. Uh, before we did it again, or actually not even that, because we did an animated yep. lost scene for the 10-year anniversary clerks where we animated the funeral scene that we never got really to shot from the original film where Randall, you know, knocks the body over and, you know, the casket over and the body came out. So if you haven't seen the lost scene, please, you can look it up on Google and stuff like that. It's on YouTube. Very, very funny. So we got to visit these characters. And because Kevin is such a genius writer and Jeff Anderson, who plays Randall, is such an amazing guy at getting the line and the way that he says his line so well. It didn't take much rehearsal at all, maybe two or three days at most, getting back into the swing of those characters. And, uh, and I, and I got to just hand it to Kevin that he knows how to age them well. Like the conversations that we had as 23 year olds making the first course are not the same as where we were in our 30s. So, uh, and I can't wait to work on a Clerks 3, um, which we've had in our possession now for about a year I've had the script. It's that kind of thing where you buy someone a Christmas gift in like April, and you're like, fuck. <laughs> I totally want her, re I can't wait to see her reaction when she opens this on December. Mm, it's killing me. So, you know, the script's been in my safe at home for quite a while, and uh, Kevin uh, has now decided to move forward more acts too, so I don't know what I'm playing in that because the scripts haven't been handed out for that. I could be playing Dante, I might be playing Gil Hicks, suitor number three again, who knows? <laughs> Maybe I'm Grant Hicks reporting on the, the mall, who knows? I could be any Hicks that he wants to, to do. Now, uh, how much of that was just straight up on the script and how much of it was sort of reworked or ad libbed while you were shooting? The first one is pretty much 98% Kevin. I mean, he was, you know, it was his first film, it was his first, you know, thing that he wrote feature length, and here he is, his words, he wanted his words said the way he wrote them, and he wanted them said the way he wanted them said. You know, uh, there, were time, there were a couple of times during the first Clerks that he would give me line readings of certain ways of saying certain things, just so he'd get the right kind of tone. I was never far off of what he was looking for, and we would never take many takes, because we were shooting in black and white, and you know, that's cheap film, not because we were artistic, it was because we were broke. Um, <laughs> you know, it was cheaper to do black and white film because with color film you have to have professional lighting, and then filters, and we wanted to just use the fluorescence in the store, and if you use fluorescence <laughs> with color film, you all turn that matrix color green. And so to do that, you have to get the expensive lights. They couldn't afford the expensive lights. We went black and white. It, it covered everything up. We had, you know, regular makeup on, and, and that worked. And that was the way we did it. So after a third, you know, take, he'd be sweating. Like, oh, would you fucking get the line right? It's burning through film. So uh, that's kind of why we went that route. Yeah, I mean, what was considered low budget for you guys back in 94 is now, I mean, you could make that movie for extra cheaper. Than you did it back then. Could you could. I mean, with the, the, the technology today where you can use a regular DSLR that you could buy for maybe like $300, a good Canon or a good Nikon, or even some of the uh, Black Magic cameras or a RED um, for a couple of grand, you can do that, own it yourself to make future stuff, or you can rent it for a couple of hundred bucks and get like a Zoom player or a really good task cam or something. And, and as long as you have a great script and some really talented people in front of you to say what you're going to do, you could do anything, shoot documentary or whatever. So the, the, op the obstacle now is not how can I get something shot, it's how can I get something seen. Right. Because of so many outlets. When you have the advent of YouTube and Netflix and now Hulu and and, Vu, and, Vu, and all these other ones that are Voodoo, whatever it's called, um, coming out, giving the ability to produce 
And if you can come to them, you know, it's no longer network TV and studios that will pick up and distribute your film anymore theatrically. There's a lot of people who, the only theatrical films that we see these days in theaters are the films that get highlighted here at Comic-Con, the, the big superhero blockbuster action adventures and things like that. The rest, people just love to stream when they want to see it. So streaming is, you know, now that the bandwidth issue, because that was always the thing. Yeah. Bandwidth was never accessible out into the hinterlands of America and Europe and Africa and Asia, but the more and more bandwidth and the infrastructure to send bandwidth quickly, uh, it makes it easier for people to have, you know, 72 fucking inches of screen in their house going like, yeah, and sitting in naked watching their popcorn, yeah, no, no. why do I need to go to a theater? Well, I'm not going to theater because I can't sit naked watching movies. Yeah, here's my hammer Thor, you know. <laughs> It's that, type of, it's that type of stuff now that it, it, it's killing the theater business, so what they do is they come up with different ways to get you into the theater. Like, we're going to take out every other row and put a small table across and you can drink your face off here. They uh, tested that program right here. Well, no. <laughs> the, down in uh, Austin, Texas, Alamo Draft House, that's what it was. I was like, I was there for a screening of Clerks 2 for a Q&A, and I was like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> And it had little, very dim, low light, so what happens if you need another drink, they had a little plastic menu, you would just wave it in front of the light, and the waitress would say, would you like another beer? And I'm like, of course. <laughs> That's five, sir. I was driven here. <laughs> so anyway, so it's that type of thing that gets people back into the theaters. And that's what you gotta do. You gotta do dog and pony tricks to get people back in. If it's not a big blockbuster film, that is. No. I, get, I see a lot of comments online and talk to people, and they don't realize you're acting in the Clerks films. Do people come up and talk to you like you are Dante? Well, yeah. I mean, um, I get a lot of, hey, Dante, what's up, brother? I'm like, how many times have I told you to stop smoking weed in front of my store? You know? <laughs> you just go with it? Yeah, I just go with it. It's usually my hotel room door. Like, how many times have I told you to stop smoking weed in front of my hotel door? Get in here with that bomb. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, they're, they're, I, and I get it, when you're an unknown and you portray a very iconic character that it has become, that people love that character, that they'll always be that character. And I, and I find that to, to be a blessing as well as a curse. It's a blessing in a sense because my other fellow actors who've done other things that you'll know that I've seen him in something, but they don't have an iconic thing that they've always been that character. It, it, to me, it gives me a slight advantage and it's a kind of a slight curse at the same time. Yes, I've known from playing Dante and Hicks and all these other films with Kevin as well. But at the same time, some of the narrow-minded people in, in big casting offices are like, well, that's just that Dante dude, you know what I mean? And it's like, well, then you're a fucking unskilled person that shouldn't be in that job if you don't have a, the grasp of my my experience because a lot of my experience comes from live stage theater and so uh, that's where I developed a lot of characters As a matter of fact in live theater I played a lot of um, antagonists a lot of evil murderous you know threatening types so it wasn't until I started doing Kevin and other comedies on stage that the comic part of it became like oh wow this guy is hilarious and he's funny and what a whiny bitch he'd be perfect for this role <laughs> speaking of whiny bitches what do you have? <laughs> <laughs> you walked into that one. I'm so sorry. That's You're a beautiful this woman, is of my course. My job, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, go ahead. She's like, I'm out of here. <laughs> Fuck you, clerk boy. Uh, so Kevin Smith is a huge Dick Grassy fan, and I was wondering if he uh, happened to um, pass that on to you, that love of Degrassi. Oh, Degrassi, hi. Yeah. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> He went to uh, Vancouver Film School for a couple of semesters, and that's where he fell in love with it. And um, he would talk about it here, and he was like, well, that was the 90210 before America at Beverly Hills 90210. And I was like, wow, I didn't want Beverly, to Beverly Hills 90210 anyway, so Canada can keep that shit show too. No. Uh, <laughs> I, would, I, I know what Degrassi is about. I've seen the episodes like Kevin on, and Jay were obviously on, and uh, I would have loved to have been addicted to it. I just didn't have the time to watch it. I was watching other bullshit on TV. Thank but thank you. I, I apologize if you were in it. If, if you, I'm sorry. I, I was is she in it? Yeah. I was just going to ask if the rest of these guys are lining up to ask questions or to be insulted by Brian. Yeah. Insulted? Okay, so now you have to think of a different insult for every okay. person that comes up here. You got it. So. What's up, Mr. Spenning? How's it going, Brian? How are you uh, uh, I know they're two good friends of yours, but I was hoping you can let us know some, you know, you got to work with Brian Johnson on Vulgar, and then of course yes. Kevin Smith. 
Um, what are, which one do you like working better, or like working for better? What, director-wise? And yeah, some pros and cons. Of both. You know, everybody has their unique uh, style of directing. Uh, what was great about, what's great about working with Kevin is uh, I completely get everything he's saying, and he's really good at giving you insight as to what he'd like. If you don't like it, he'll just say, try to suck less. You know, he's actually <laughs> said that, so. <laughs> He really cuts to the chase. Brian Johnson, he had such a difficult script to direct in the sense of this emotional arc. Who, who has seen Vulgar here? Anybody have seen Vulgar? Yeah, it's a twisted film. I have it on sale at my booth, by the way, 35 bucks. Um, it's a twisted tale about a guy who's a party clown for kids, who's not making, you know, who would, you know, you'd hire for their, your kid's birthday party, who's not making enough money, so he becomes a clown for adults, and his first gig goes horribly wrong. It's like a buddy comedy for the first 20 minutes that takes a left turn into, what the fuck am I watching? <laughs> Where Brian Johnson handed me the script, when he first handed me the script, he's like, I thought of you when I wrote this, and then I went home and I read it halfway through and went, what the fuck, man? <laughs> and the first draft had things like feces involved and stuff. I was like, oh my God. And I called him like, what do you mean you thought of me when you wrote this? You need therapy, son. Uh, so he was, he, he was really great at giving me a lot of leeway, as opposed to Kevin, which was like, this is how it's going to be. He knew what he wanted. Uh, Brian Johnson was very trusting of what I could do, which I was very thankful for, and I put a lot of research into it. It's a, it's a movie that's not for everybody. It's not a first date movie, that's for sure. Because <laughs> the, the date would be like, well, what do you do? Well, you know, exactly. So it's not Thanksgiving having it with the grandparents. It's not that type of movie, but it, a lot of work that I put into it, and he was able to give me that leeway to do it. Uh, I worked with M. Night Shyamalan in The Happening. He was a lot of fun to work with. Very secretive. You can only see the pages you were involved in. I didn't even know what the film was about until literally I saw it at the premiere and I was like, oh, I thought I was in the What's Happening movie. I, 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 I was waiting for Rerun and Raj and Shirley to come on out. What the hell? What's this with people killing themselves? Um, and then I got to work with James L. Brooks in a film called uh, How Do You Know? Uh, it was with uh, Reese Witherspoon and Paul Rudd and Jack Nicholson and I had a scene that got deleted but I got a ha nice handwritten letter from, from the director J uh, who said, uh, you know, I'm so sorry but you didn't make it into the final cut due to time restrictions but you'll be in the deleted scene. So when the DVD came out I finally saw it and it's a scene with myself as a waiter and Reese Witherspoon, Paul Rudd and, and me and Paul have uh, mutual friends together so I got to talk to them. And, James was very weird in the sense that he was take, we would be taking take after take after take where he would just be laughing his ass off, like during the take, like, <laughs> and the sound guy's like, <laughs> cut, uh, how was that, not good? <laughs> it's not, you know, this isn't a television show with the canned audience, it's recorded in front of a live studio audience, and literally, this is something that James wrote himself, and he's, we're on take seven, and this same two minute scene, and he's like, ha ah! <laughs> ha I asked the first AD, I said, what's up with Mr. Brooks? He's like, he's doing this the whole fucking production. We've written three letters to the producers, we've moved Video Village, that's the place where they have the monitors, outside the building, and you can still hear him going, ha ah! <laughs> Because at one point I went up to him, are we shooting this in 3D with like 15 different cameras at different angles? That's where we're going again and again and again. He goes, no, we just can't get the sound mixed straight. So anyway, he was fun to work with, but it was just bizarre. <laughs> and then I worked with a couple of independent filmmakers, their first time filmmakers, uh, Jessica Hudson. I did a film up in Toronto called Drop Dead Roses, a very funny romantic comedy. I think you can find that on Netflix. Um, and some other first time filmmakers that it's really great working with first time filmmakers because they've still got that absolute passion. You can have some kind of influence as to what's going on, and, and I, always, I always enjoy it. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Brian. Hi, Brian. How are you? Good, how are you? Listen here, motherfucker. Oh, jeez. What's that? You got a Japanese written or Korean written Batman? What is that, Japanese? Or yeah, it says, it? um, hey, Dante. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I just got two questions. Sure. Um, first one, uh, in the Clerks movie, I, one thing that just kind of amazed me was that scene where you and Randall, that their first real scene with Randall, the amount of dialogue and the amount of lines in that one scene was just... To me, it was like all, I think there was about two takes, because I think I saw there was a little break in um... Well, the, the longest single take in that movie, which was the second thing we shot, was uh, when Caitlin comes back from college and I bring her into the video store, right. and I'm like, what's this I hear about you getting married? And as you watch it, there is no breaks, there's no cutting, it's just a single shot of the two of us, it's seven minutes of straight up dialogue. and. Um, 
that's something I think that my theater background was a huge, huge plus in because when you do theater, you know, you come up on a stage live and you're doing an hour, two hour show with a live audience. There's like, oh, I screwed up online. Let me stop. Let me take this again. You know, you got to keep on going. So my memory tolerance was built very high to, to do that. And he's a very verbose, you know, uh, writer and he puts in a lot of highfalutin words that, you know, we all knew when we were studying for English tests that we were like, I'll never use fucking acumen ever again. What the fuck? What is this bullshit? Um, so it's that type of thing that I think he really trusted. And he was very lucky to back it. A uh, good third of the cast, if not two thirds of the cast came from theater. Right on. And my second question is, uh, to this day, are you still a firm believer of uh, you never go ask him out? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's just weird. <laughs> you never go ask him out. I mean, I mean, if the girl wants to, but it, if then if you don't see her after that night, maybe. Because <laughs> then it's like, hmm, I got corn the other night. I saw you eat that. <laughs> <laughs> right? All right, moving on. Thank you. Yeah, see, corn is what everybody gets it. Everybody else is fine with the joke until I get to the corn part. And they're like, oh, why'd you bring up corn? <laughs> is corn the go-to non-digestible food? Of uh, all the things that you Highest in fiber. Stool. Highest in fiber. Yeah? Yeah. It's not because it's like yellow. Has anybody been pulled over by the cops and eat all their weed so they don't get it on them? And then just a day later, you're seeing the branches and twigs coming out? Come on. <laughs> and then you go, when did I do this? Oh, right, I was fucking high as a kite when I did this. That's right. I've never done that, that's just a joke. Hi, Ryan. Oh, yeah. Look so, at you lime green motherfucker. It's actually bright yellow. Very yellow under this light. Looks green. green to me. Yeah. Okay. Get your eyes checked. Um, so of all the clerks cast, you always hear the person that makes the best first impression is Jason Hughes. So how were you first introduced to Jay, and is there any favorite Jay stories you have? Ooh, good question. Uh, first time introduced to him, he was he was extremely shy and squirrely cat. You know, that was him. He was just squirrely. And I was explained by Kevin that um, the scenes that we're going to do with him, he doesn't like people watching. He was a 17-year-old dude who was nervous, never did anything. So he was just this cat that Kevin had known. And, um, you know, he's going to be the local drug dealer, and he's got that whole, that whole vibe going for him. So uh, we would have to um, supply him with... Um, some ginseng and um, unsweetened iced tea <laughs> to get him in the mood for the J character. Yeah, that'll work. Um, <laughs> and so uh, one of the things, though, was only Kevin could be with him, and obviously Dave Klein was the DP, and then Scott Mosier was the sound guy holding the boom, and that was pretty much, no one could watch the scenes that they would do. Uh, when it came to the scenes inside the store, we shot them towards the end of the schedule where he became more comfortable with who we were. And it was just like, he was always never like making eye contact. He was just like just a young, squirrely, nervous kid. So as we went on to do other things, I mean, here it was, he then got picked up to do Mallrats. This was our second film. Universal Studios is going to do it. And, you know, the Jane Silent Bob characters are predominant in Mallrats. Um, but the studio, Universal, was kind of nervous about this unknown kid who barely, you know, was able to do the first one, allegedly. Um, they had uh, Seth um, uh, Green, thank you, Seth Green flown to Minnesota, learning the lines, in the wings, just waiting for Jay not to show up or not to do something for him to come in. Imagine Seth Green going, Snoochie Moochies, motherfucker! <laughs> I don't want to really? imagine that world. It'd be like Chris from Family Guy, like, uh, you know what I mean? It's just more. <laughs> I don't want to imagine that world. Huh? I don't want to imagine that world. Right. So, uh, Jay, thank God, he pulled it off and was awesome in it and has been awesome ever since. And since he's been sober, which I think he's going on seven years being clean and sober, he's been even funnier. So, yeah, big round of applause for that. Thank you. You're Hello. What's up there, Captain Kirk? Uh, this is from the next generation. <laughs> Not my fucking generation. <laughs> Wait, you'd rather be Worf than Kirk? Uh, no. Uh, Riker. Shh, he's in the room. Oh, is he? No, I fucking don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love, yeah, I'd love to be Worf. Comes in with a big back left and that fucking slice you and then it here. So now that you've busted our guest balls, what's your question? Right on. Sorry. <laughs> Um, first off, thanks again for coming to Edmonton. It's awesome to have right you. Right on. Well, thank the promoters for having me. I'd love to come back or even go to Calgary. Uh, you guys have been awesome. Uh, yeah. yeah. Right on. Local pride. 
Uh, I was just wondering, uh, Kevin talked a lot about the third clerks uh, being a, uh, a play. He thought that would be an interesting idea to play around with, uh, which I think is stupid. But I'm just curious what your thoughts on that were, and like if there'd be any. Uh, Dude, I was and cons. all I was all for the play idea. Yeah, I'm a theater. Guy. Oh yeah, but I can just imagine. Usually plays run a minimum of like you know three months to eight months as a just a one-time one-shot type of thing. Imagine trying to wrangle Jay Muse and Jeff Anderson for that long. They just would have, they would have been going out of their minds. And I remember there was, someone had recorded some Q&A that Kevin did where he said he'd emailed Jeff going, Jeff, Jeff, I got this great idea. Clerks 3, let's do it by. And Jeff emailing back going like, I think you're smoking way too much pot. <laughs> And he said, no, no, just imagine, we could do this, that, and the other thing. And then he said, oh, I see you've moved on to crack. <laughs> so uh, he knew that O'Halloran was on board because I'm the only the group of us, the, the only actor out of the group of us who, does, who did live theater. So I was like, I could do eight months, I could do three years on Broadway, it'd be awesome. And then if like the whole Tony Awards, I'm like, snoochie boochies, motherfuckers! <laughs> <laughs> and like, and for the Shakespeare play, we have, you know, I just hope we don't just see, sit next to people who are like, have high heart, high art type of plays, and me being the audience would be hilarious. <laughs> Thank you for awesome. the question. Thank you. Hello. What's up there? Um, you can do it, I believe in you. Oh, God. <laughs> Come on. Listen here, Pearl Jam. I don't know. <laughs> All right. I just, I just see the whole, you know. Sure. So my, I have two questions. My first yeah. one is, will you rotate my tires while I wait? Well, I rotate. <laughs> <laughs> right on. And uh, the second one is, with doing the movies and the cartoon, uh, with cartoon work and voice acting being much different, mm. like, which would you prefer to oh. do? I mean, if it was a choice of one or the other, that's a tough choice. But I mean, as far as having a lot of fun, I had a blast doing the cartoon voices. It was the easiest way of acting in a sense of, you'd get out of your, I was, they were recording in LA, I was still living in New York, so I would, they flew me out, they put me up in a hotel when doing those episodes. So I'd just get up, shower, literally walk, don't have to worry about your looks, you just show up and just clear your voice, you get handed the script, and then you just start, you know, rolling with the dialogue. But with cartoon dialogue as Dante or Randall or any of the cartoon characters, you have to kind of amp it up. As we called, we need to get more cartoon Dante, which is more like, exasperated, like, Randall, you can't do that. You know, like, there's this big bee outside. You know, it's, it's <laughs> saying that voice in live action is just kind of bizarre, you know? But the awesome thing about it is like, we, the physics of the world and the whole thing is just, you're not limited to it. So you can go to outer space, you can have an outbreak monkey in the back of the store. You know, and, and you could have the big ending where the Korean animators take over and it's like, Who's driving car? Bad driving car? How can that be? You know, it was the thing when we were making it, I was like, This is my Simpsons money, I'll be doing this forever! And then the fucking mouse rammed it in the ass and we were like, Fuck! That stupid Disney Corporation. So, and it was, uh, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire became a huge hit for ABC back then in the States, and so they were like, we're going to put game shows on TV all the time, it's going to take every time slot, and this is before Game Show Network existed, and so uh, we only got the six episodes, so we'll see, but I mean, last year, uh, Jason Mewes uh, and his wife uh, produ produced a cartoon, an animated Jay and Silent Bob super groovy movie, uh, that came out, yeah, and Robert Stark, I think his name is, was the animator, did an amazing job with it, and, um, and uh, you know, so we could do some version of an animated series at some point, but not that exact version, because Disney owns the rights to that. But that's something that I always tell Kevin, like, look, when our faces are too ugly for live shit, we could totally continue to do the voices, so, who knows, we'll see. Thank you. You're welcome. And can you lift up a gallon of jug yet? Oh, yeah, yeah, Rick Darris, he can go kiss my ass. <laughs> I can lift a 12-pack of beer, no problem. Hello! Hi! You, you got a little something on your face there, honey. I had some bit in the middle of it. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. You had someone, a clown, finish on you. Anyway! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. High <laughs> watermark of the panel. Oh, <laughs> shit. Yeah. Let's see. Who's, in that? Who's in the room after me after that one? <laughs> Who is it? Michael Dorn. Oh. <laughs> Michael Dorn, you'll never believe what was just in here. We gotta hose this whole place down because of the filth that's coming out of that man's mouth. <laughs> this is a children's show. 
What's your question? Okay, I was just wondering if you've always wanted to do acting or if you've always been in theater? Um, no, actually, um, as the youngest of three sons, I always acted out for attention. So it was a way to harness the, the kind of like, oh, I look at me, look at me type of thing. But uh, when I was growing up, my father was an automotive a mechanic and engineer. So I was going through that type of line of interest. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed away uh, at the age of 51 from heart disease. Uh, when I was 15, so that kind of threw me into a tailspin emotionally, and so um, what I did was I used to uh, role-play games, you know, D&D, yeah, villains, vigilantes, champions, DC heroes, things like that, uh, Iron Crown for the Lord of the Rings stuff, uh, and then everyone saw all the one-shots like Call of Cthulhu, Paranoia, and stuff like that, so I used to table game a lot, and so um, through table gaming, I was more of the type of person who wanted, who really acted out during the whole thing, like really stupid nerdy shit that was awesome at the same time, where you'd literally go, I worked at a fast food chicken joint uh, uh, at the time, and so I would, we would literally get done from school on Friday, I would go up and get like 32 pieces up from my job, bring it down, and we would have literally 72 hours of fucking just non-stop gaming with like three hour naps in between at my, my friend's basement. It was, it was the stench after the weekend was terrible, but we had fun. <laughs> And our imaginations ran wild, and it was the type of thing that developed who I was as a person. And then uh, when I got into senior year of high school, I was, you know, a friend of mine who had role played with me was into acting. He was kind of a, a very popular kid. He was like, You should do, you know, you're really good when we do the gaming. You should come and do some acting. So I auditioned for stuff for high school and went from there. So that's what got me out of it. In a sense, it was just gaming has kind of saved my life because I don't know what I would have done probably without gaming. Table gaming, that is, and video gaming. So uh, I had a, a smart group of nerd friends and. Uh, we kind of helped each other along. And here I am today, talking about the clowns. Thank you. Hey, Brian. What's up? Couldn't uh, pick out anything better than sweats today? What's up, sir? I guess so. <laughs> uh, I met you the other day. I found you really to be an approachable celebrity. Uh, oh, thank you. Now, fucking uh, get out of here. <laughs> Security! Actually, I have two questions and one request. Sure, what's that? First question is, um, if, say, Kevin Smith decided to continue with, like, Clerks 13 or 14, whatever. We have to get by three first. <laughs> Could you see uh, Randall and Dante as old men in an old age home type storyline scenario? Well, either that or cellmates in some sort of Shawshank Redemption type of thing. <laughs> and so it was, Dante tottered his way through a half a mile of filth that a man could never... You know, I could see that happening. <laughs> Because I had killed Jay. <laughs> Even though he was the owner and half owner of the store. That would be that would be funny. Um, grumpier old clerks would be a great title, I guess. <laughs> Play on grumpy old men type of thing, something like that. And what's what's the request? Um, the request is uh, I know Jeff Anderson's living out in the woods or something. Mm -hmm. um, if I don't know if you guys are as tight as Dante and Randall were, if maybe you could call him up for us to say hey. Um, I, we are not that tight. Um, as a matter of fact, most of my calls to him go straight to voicemail. And it's not even him on the voicemail, it's that, you have reached such and such. You know, it's not like him going, hey, I'm not here today, but, 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 but no. So, um, I would love to have, and that would have been awesome, but, uh, I, I will not. <laughs> Too bad. Yeah, he doesn't answer my calls that way. It's mostly email transactions. He does. He lives on a. He's not kidding. He does live in Central California, up in this big wooded area. He has this uh, business that he has. That, yeah, that that's how he makes his living. And uh, and every once in a while, it's like you know, I have, I don't have any really sell servants here. But if you want to email me, so if I had emailed him and then waited for a reply, maybe. But I highly doubt it. You know what it is. He loves gatherings, but he hates people. <laughs> so it's kind of antisocial, then. It's kind of antisocial. It's for this. Thanks for the question and the request. Bag. Hello, sir. It's Hello. just a bag. It's just a bag. Yeah, it, it's just a bag. What's in the bag? He's holding his bag. It's a book and uh, the thing that you autographed earlier. Oh, why, thank you. Uh, previous customers, later, General. <laughs> You're returning it. You want your money back, don't you? <laughs> no. Uh, this thing's broken? <laughs> it's a signature. I know. It broke by heart. It's terrible. Can I have it back, please? I'm assuming that you don't have hubcaps for a 1979 Pinto hatchback? Holy <laughs> shit, I do. Magazine. I do. Back of the hotel. <laughs> my other question is, I was uh, on like looking through YouTube, and I found something that kind of disturbed me, and I don't think you had any hand in it, but it was a like, Just clerks. something on YouTube yeah, no. that really disturbed you? <laughs> it was, uh, That's how they make was, their money, is disturbing things. It was a live action, videos. clerks. 
pilot. Yes, I was just talking about. Kind of was like you oh. weren't in it as Dante. Nope. And uh, it was kind of I didn't even think Kevin Smith was involved. Nope. How did that come about? Do you know so, anything about that? Yes, I kind of. Yes, 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 like I do. So. Um, okay. Clarks had come out and was pretty successful, so to speak, in the art house circles of things. So the rights are owned by the Miramax Film Company, which is the same people who are owned by Disney. That's why Disney has the right to do the cartoon and blah, 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 blah. So uh, WB, Warner Brothers, and uh, Don Rio, a very big time producer writer in Hollywood in the, er in the early 90s, said, we should you know, jump on this new Generation X thing and uh, do a show about this generator Generation X people. And so they came up with this really unbelievably crappy pilot, and I'm going to say, I don't give a fuck, crappy pilot. It was like a Saved by the Bell type of production value. And I'm pleased if I'm insulting the Saved by the Bell fans, I'm sorry. But it was that kind of like bubblegum set that looked like so super duper fake, like your back of the ice cream shop type of thing. Um, and it, but it starts some pretty okay people. I mean, I love Jim Brewer, the, the stand-up comic. Do you know him from yeah. Half-Baked and whatnot? He was cast as Randall. Um, Carrie, uh, um, who's the girl from Felicity? Uh, Russell. Carrie Russell played like one of the girlfriends, like Veronica, and some unknown guy played the Dante role. And then they didn't have Jane sign the Bob, so I was out in LA at the time, taking meetings with uh, agents, and uh, I was taking a meeting with this agent, and he goes, "Oh, by the way, are you going to audition for the Clerks TV show?" And I was just like, um, "What?" He was like, well, yeah, Warner Brothers is going to be doing a pilot for the Clerks sitcom. I'm like, is Kevin Smith involved? He goes, no, it's Don Rio. So I was like, oh, yeah. He's like, do you want to be submitted? I'll submit it for you. I'm like, yeah, please do. I'd love to submit for that role. You know, so then I got out of that meeting, and this is before a cell phone, so I quickly ran to some sort of payphone and called up Kevin's office and said, Kevin, are you involved in this Clerks uh, TV pilot? He goes, what? <laughs> He didn't know this, so I said, yeah, it's being done by Warner Brothers, it's uh, some guy, Don Rio, producer Don Rio, I said, yeah, all right, and apparently he got involved, and they said, oh, we're going to do it this way, and he was like, well, I want to be an executive producer, and then he saw what was going to be done, he's like, I well, don't want you using the Jane Silent Bob characters for this shit, and so um, they pulled the two Jane Silent, because I think it was Ray and something else, I forget the two, but it was the Jay and Bob were Ray and someone else, and it was terrible. And what the thing was is, instead of the clerks being smarter than the customers and making fun of them, it was the customers giving them crap and just <coughs> pooing on them. So they, I went in and I auditioned, didn't get the role. I called up Marilyn Gigliotti, who was out there, she auditioned Jeff. We all auditioned. The original cast auditioned and none of us got the roles. <laughs> It was the best blessing in disguise because this thing was horrible. So months go by. I'm back in Jersey. We're shooting Chasing Amy, I think it was, when finally um, they, Kevin had gotten a copy, a VHS copy of the pilot that never got picked up. And uh, he's like, Did you, by the way, the would you avoid it? And he puts this in, and it's terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. And, uh, yeah, so uh, I, I wouldn't mind seeing it done today by... You know, some like by Kevin especially, and doing it not for network television, but an HBO or Showtime or straight to Netflix type of thing. I think it'd be funny. But yeah, thank well, you. You are that. correct. It is really bad. Oh, awful. So yeah, if you find it, it's like the Clerks TV pilot. Terrible. Thanks for bringing that up. It's really bad. We got our five minute warning, guys. So this is going to be our last two questions. Just letting everybody know, so you're not disappointed. It's right on. For nothing. Yeah, this thing moves so fast. It's crazy. Okay, sir. Hi. Um, of all the stuff you've done with Kevin Smith, what is your favorite scene or part of the movies that you've done? You've wow, well, that's like asking a, chi a mother her favorite child. They've all been really cool, you know? I mean, um, I, I gotta say that a lot of stuff in Clerks 2 was a lot of fun to work with. I mean, when I would go and get my call sheet for the day of what we'd be working on or the day before, I'm like, all right, what are we doing tomorrow? Tomorrow I am at a go-kart track all day. All right. And then the next day I'd be like, what are we doing now? Oh, I'm uh, making out with Rosario Dawson. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Don't get paid enough. You know, and then the next day we'd be like, all right, we are going to have a big dance number where you're watching Rosario Dawson dance in front of you. God damn it. <laughs> the next day we would get like, all right, we're going to have a donkey show. <laughs> a live donkey. Well, all right. 
<laughs> it's, it's that type of thing where you just couldn't help but the things that Kevin writes and the, the situations that he put these characters and other characters in as well. I mean, even with Mallrats, this is the first time doing a real movie with a real studio. I was just like, it's Shannon Doherty, you know, like, you know, it's these type of things. Like, it's Michael Rooker. It's like, it was just, it's amazing and I'm truly blessed for having to do what I had to do. And, and even the cartoon, doing the cartoon series, and I got to work with such great, amazing com voiceover comedians and comedians in general. Um, that it was, uh, as a kid, I was always mimicking cartoons and, you know, the, the Bugs Bunnies and the Tom and Jerry's and, and uh, the Flintstones and the Jetsons and things like that, that the, any of the Hanna-Barbera stuff that when I finally got to do some voices and they were like, but you're only going to just do your voice. I'm like, what? You're not even giving me chances to do other voices? No, we have real people to do that one for you. I'm like, all right. Um, but still, I got to do uh, a cartoon, have little in-action figures, and so uh, it's uh, been a blessing, that's for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have one last question, guy. Where'd he go? It was staff. Oh, he was staff? Oh, he was just holding the line? Yeah. Aw. For a second, second I thought they men. caught staff. He had a staff <laughs> infection. <laughs> he was rushed out of this room. <laughs> oh, what is it? I think it's staff. <laughs> it could happen. It can. It could happen. Hey, I want to go back to something you said earlier because, sure. I mean, fandom for a lot of people is a lifeline. And you talked about like role-playing games, video games, things like that, saving your life. Yeah. So I wonder if we can sort of end after, you know, real life shit posting for 45 minutes. Yeah. Um, just uh, give people sort of that bit of your journey, how you sort of went from that really dark, confused place and now crack jokes and insult people for a living. Well, like, you know, the fact that um, I, I was working a regular job, I worked for a supermarket chain called ShopRite, uh, and I worked my way through that when um, I, I met a girl in my senior year of high school, she was a freshman, and so I was dating her throughout her whole year of high school, and so I was working in a supermarket chain, and it was, I had stopped acting during that part, but I became more grumpy, I mean, not grumpy in the sense because of the girlfriend, but just like, I just, the artistic side of me was just always calling to come out. Um, so when, when she went to college and uh, we kind of ended it in a sense because she's like, I'm going to college, I'm going to fuck guys. I'm like, all right, go ahead, whatever. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Um, but uh, I, I used to, we, I still would role play with friends and stuff and my one great friend would always see like, you, you still need a creative outlet and I would complain about, look at that motherfucker, he doesn't know what he's doing on stage and stuff like that. So he got me into back into auditioning again and I, I had auditioned for a show, uh, a stage production of Dracula. And so um, I auditioned for Renfield, the lunatic, the insane lunatic that assists Dracula. And I auditioned for it out of the theater that Kevin used to audition extras for his film. And uh, it got really great reviews, and uh, the, the, the theater community in New Jersey and New York started to see this young kid who was really good and, and do other things. And I went from show to show to show. I, I had left ShopRite, which I was doing amazing. I was one of the youngest managers they ever had, and I was really good at what I did. And, and my mother was like, what the hell is wrong with you? She's Irish, by the way. What the hell is wrong with you? Everybody needs to eat. You know, I was, at the age of like 20, I was clearing. After taxes, five twenty a week. It was sick the amount of money, but it wasn't. It wasn't to me. The money wasn't the thing. It was like I needed to have that creative outlet. So when I went into acting and did other things, and and it was a it was a lot of fun uh, continuing with it. Chance with auditioning, which I nearly missed the audition for Kevin, because I got the notice a month prior from the theater owner. Uh, next month, these guys going to hold auditions out of our theater. I said, sure, I'll be there. I was doing a show at another theater at the time. The first night of auditions happened. I forgot. I didn't go. The next morning, the owner of the theater called up and said, hey man, I thought you were going to come. And I was like, oh shit, was that, was that last night? He goes, is there another one today? I go, yeah. And then we came back, and uh, the second night, auditioned. He liked what I did. I didn't know what I was auditioning for. I just knew it was like a comedy. It could have been porn for all I knew. <laughs> and, uh, right, exactly, right? And I'm like, do I need to do what now? Um, snowballing? We, we have to see this? <laughs> uh, so it was that type of thing that uh, he liked what I did, and the original person who was cast as Dante, because when I auditioned, they were just day player roles, you know. And uh, he liked what I did. I did this very evil, menacing role from a play I was doing at the time called Wait Until Dark. And uh, if you have a 10-year Clerks X edition, the extras have the auditions, you'll see it. It was an awful audition. I was turning my back, I was pacing a lot. It's like the worst audition ever. And, um, but he liked what I did, and he thought, well, if this guy could do an evil villain, he could easily do any type of slappy clerk. And so that's how I got that role. And then it was just doing the film. I continued to work at another business for a while. And then when they got it edited, because we shot it in the spring, 
He edited it all summer. He submitted it to film festivals by October. We had the first screening in New York with the original ending where Dante gets killed. Spoiler alert. Um, and then it got submitted uh, to Sundance where Bob Hawke, who happened to be at that first screening in New York, passed it around, got him in touch with John Pearson, who's a producer and rep, who also represented people like Spike Lee, Jim Jarmusch, and others. And then uh, it went on to Sundance to do amazing stuff, and then got picked up there by the, the Miramax Corporation, uh, Miramax Films, and then went on from there. The fact that Kevin was loyal enough in a sense to think, I loved working with these guys before, let's do it again, and then gave me Gil Hicks and went on to do other things, Chasing Amy, and then Dogma and whatnot. It's been a lot of fun, and, I, and I've been really blessed, and that does, that my artistic outlet has been very sated. And in the meantime, I still did theater in New York and New Jersey, and that's still my, my uh, prime acting is through theater. But uh, it's something like out there, Definitely, you, your artistic side is a calling, is your passion. You follow it. You know, it, you find places to do it. If you can't do it yourself, I mean, people today, you know, podcasting has saved a lot of people's lives in a sense as well because it's a way to get their voices heard. And if people log on, like, oh my God, I had 20,000 downloads the other day or listeners, and, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. And I think the more we can communicate and tell the stories from different parts of the country and different parts of the world, it makes us a better society because instead of that fear, that ignorance that keeps people into fear, into racism and all sorts of things, it's the dialogue that gets us closer as people and as better you know, to move along. So that's the way I think of it as. On that note, that's a great place to wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.